I talk with so many people and they'll say, oh, I've got this fabulous strategy. How have you done the past three years? Well, the strategy's done really well. I've lost money. <laughs> what happened was, two years ago, I was following this strategy, but I didn't follow it the way I should have. I, I bought in July when I should have bought in August. And if I'd done that right, I would have made money. So that counts as a, as a year that worked. No, it didn't work. And, and we, we fool ourselves into believing that these things work when they don't. And um, if we're on this side of the room, we're taking extra risks. And on average, we're not going to be rewarded. The total reward on this side of the room, through time, on average, will be the same as the total reward on this side of the room. These people take less risk, maybe an, an annual vol um, a, uh, volatility. We have this thing we call a 20% me risk measure. And people on this side of the room are going to be taking 30, 40, 50, 60 percent. Why would you take 50 percent more risk or 100 percent more risk and get on average the same reward? It just doesn't make sense. But we do it. We're drawn to it like moths to a flame. I, I'm guilty of it. I do it too. We can have a confessional here. Um, How's well, the Bank of New York doing, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> you came to the previous talk, and I speculated a little Bank of New York. And I will admit, I bought some shares this morning at 26.89. I regret it, or 25.89. I know it's 89 cents. So um, uh, this this is filed under "Don't do as I say, uh, do as do as I say, don't do as I do." But it's with a small amount of money. That's like these people who go to Vegas and they say, "Look, I'm going to spend $20. Again. I've done it. I'm not a big gambler. Go down, try to get a free drink, spend." You know, $20 at the roulette table, pretend, or the, the blackjack table, try to pretend I'm a real man or something. And uh, it's fun. And uh, so I only do this with, a, with a, a small percentage of my wealth. I only speculate with a small percentage of my wealth. It's my plan. It's my hobby. I'm trying to figure out if you really did this market portfolio perfectly. Yes. Why is that different from betting on every member on the network? And the difference is a great question. What's it? If you bet on every number on the roulette table, you will lose 5.26 percent of your money because the, you're paying the casino for running the casino. But if you bet on every asset in the economy in proportion to its size, on average through time, society is going to pay you for bearing risk because bearing risk is something that has to happen to society. I get a little bit moral here for just a moment, but, the, but I, I, I believe this deeply. And that is that when somebody provides labor or steel to an economy, we all say, yeah, persons who do the manual work, who take the risks, who provide the steel, they ought to be rewarded. But the people who bear the risks should be rewarded as well. Theory says they should be rewarded. History tells us they're rewarded. Bearing risk is a valid contribution to an economy. So the answer is, if you fully diversify, you're bearing risk. And society rewards you for bearing risk that has to be borne. And this is getting a little bit sophisticated. But bearing the risk of a fully diversified portfolio is something that has to be done in society. So the people that do it will be rewarded. But taking idiosyncratic risks, those are firm-specific risks, like being a moron and putting your money in the bank in New York today. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't do anything for society. I have extra bank in New York today. Somebody had, I'm on this side of the room. <laughs> I had extra bank in New York today. So what does that mean that somebody else had? They sold it already. No, not they didn't sell it. Somebody here sold it. Somebody here has less bank of New York. That's a risk that we're both taking, and there's no reason for society to reward us for those idiosyncratic risks. So it's a very theoretical answer to a very good question, which is, the type of risk that you get in a fully diversified portfolio is rewarded through time. All these speculative risks above and beyond, outside, they're not on average rewarded. Because we know you get on average the same return as these people. You get that return for bearing a systematic risk. All those extra risks you take aren't rewarded. I bet on managers. What about that? I mean, a new man, I mean, when Stephen Jobs came to back to Apple, I bought a lot of Apple. Well, when Al Dunlop went to Sunbeam, my dad bought a lot of Sunbeam. 
he was a he was a manager that had this great track record of turnaround companies, and they did some creative accounting techniques, and uh, Sunbeam was a disaster. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And you say, well, uh, do I think that I'm able to consistently earn an abnormal profit with my own little theories? And I'd like to tell my students that if I could consistently pick those stocks that were going to go up and those stocks that were going to go down, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I'd be on a beach in the Caribbean sending postcards back to my family and relatives. I would do it um, with things I'm willing to lose. You know, if I, I take the chance, that's, that's my thing. Well, I mean, I right, if, but if you're doing it with 20 bucks at Vegas, wonderful. Yeah. If you're doing it with your retirement money, make sure your spouse knows about it and signs on to it. Because I, the theory says that that's not what you do. I, I've seen too many people too hurt by that. And if, if you can control yourself also to say, okay, I've lost some money, I quit. I, literally, I tell you the truth, when I, when I went to the casino, I would take my wallet, I would hand it to my wife, which is dangerous, I would hand it to my wife, and I would go down with only, with only $100 because I was afraid that I'd start doubling up on my bed. Yeah. And um, uh, I tell him, no matter what I say when I come back, <laughs> don't give me the wall. <laughs> so there is a human nature that sure. starts to fall behind Correct. to take more risks to try to earn it back. Won't gold peak eventually? And if you have earned a certain amount of having invested in it for a few years, uh, and you feel that's OK, and yeah. just clear your portfolio oh, there's, there's two questions I think that I'm going to read into that great question. One is gold, um, and then the second, this is, this is gold territory, AIER, here to talk a little bit about gold, and the second is bubbles. When an asset goes up and up and up, and then goes down and down and down. And this, this is going to discredit me quite a bit with you. But I don't believe that much in bubbles. You say, oh, you're nuts, you're nuts. Well, bubbles are something we see real well in the rear view mirror. You know, oh, it was, it was a bubble. But I've lived through a lot of those. And I remember watching Microsoft and Dell go up and up and up. And people were saying, it's a bubble, it's a bubble, it's a bubble. You're just watching Apple go up and up and up. And you're saying, it's a bubble, it's a bubble, it's a bubble. No, those aren't bubbles. Those were valid things. And then we see the ones that did crash, the global crossings, the um, Enrons, and we say that was a bubble. Oh, we, we, and there, you can't tell a bubble until it's over with. If, if they do exist, you certainly can't tell them until it's over with. And oh, the real estate bubble, anybody could have predicted that. Robert Schiller from Yale, a Yale person can predict it, anybody can. Robert Schiller from Yale was saying Robert Schiller from Yale was saying that the real estate was a bubble for years. And these people come out and say, oh, I've been predicting this. They prove they've been predicting it. But yeah, well, but if you check their, their background, they started predicting this years and years before. In 1996 or so, Alan Greenspan said that we, we had irrational exuberance in the equity markets. When he said that, I believe the Dow Jones was somewhere around 6,000. It wasn't irrational exuberance. It was way off the mark. So uh, uh, then in the rear view mirror, they, these values look high. So right now, gold at 1,200, whatever it is, I don't know how gold that much, it look, might look like we've had irrational exuberance. I don't know, maybe a couple years from now, we'll be talking about gold at $3,600. Now, do I think you ought to invest in gold? Yes, I slightly misspoke when I talked about this last time. Walker punished me for it. No. Walker lets me say whatever I want. Um, I said that I'm not really bullish on gold. And what I really meant to say about that, quite truthfully, is that this, um, this says invest in all assets in proportion to their size. So I would buy gold as part of the diversified portfolio. How much gold would I buy? In proportion to its size. And um, would I get out of it when it's at 1200 bucks an ounce? No. Would I double up on it when it's at 300 bucks an ounce? No. I can't predict gold prices. I, I just can't do it. We, I, want, I would love to believe it, I just can't do it. So I don't try to time the gold markets. How, how can you always tell in proportion to its size? You know? Well, that's a good question. Now, how do we put this into practice? And a good way to put this into practice is to buy indexed funds that tell you we are buying virtually every stock in a particular market or sector. So for instance, one family of funds that I really, really love is Vanguard. I don't get a kickback, but mention many of them. 
Uh, no affiliation. I love Vanguard. So for instance, I would go to Vanguard, their exchange traded funds, or maybe just their open end mutual funds, and I would get their index fund that says we invest in every US stock and we invest in every foreign stock. There is now these, they're finally coming out with them. For a long time, you kind of had to do one to get the US stocks and one to get the foreign stocks, and now they're really combining those. Schwab has some great um, of their own exchange traded funds right now. I would look for the most broadly diversified exchange traded or open end fund with the very lowest fees. That's the key is the very lowest fees. And there's one other consideration for that. If you notice on this last line I've got here, I say um, if you don't index, number one, you're taking unrewarded risk. That's the concept I was talking about with the people on this side of the room. They're taking risk that they're not going to be rewarded for. It. But they also are going to tend to have extra transactions costs and extra income taxes. Because when I'm trading Bank of New York like an idiot, I'm running up transactions costs. Some are explicit, like the commission at Schwab 899. Some are implicit, the bid ask spread I'm paying. I'm paying another commission there. And, uh, and I'm messing up my income taxes. Because every time I trade, uh, on average through time, I'm going to be recognizing short-term gains rather than long-term capital gains, which are tax advantage. So the people on this side of the room can focus on being very well diversified and can have very low transactions costs and can do tax advantage investing. That's what they can focus on. People on this side of the room are trying to beat other people at a, at a guessing game here. So, uh, so in answer to your question, I would look for an ETF that is as broadly diversified as possible. And in there, there's going to be some gold mines. They'll have new mining in it. If you buy equity, Vanguard's most diversified equity funds, it'll have some stock, some stocks that are gold mining companies in it. 